essentially about what makes the biggest difference in, in attainment uh, for students in sixth form um, and, and the strategies that you need to employ to make sure that the, the progress and learning are optimum, whilst keeping one eye on the barriers that exist to learning and come up with strategies that do work to effectively break them down. So I'm hoping to do some, some, some interactive stuff at some point, if you're willing. Um, but certainly you've got my, my absolute permission to um, stop in my tracks, ask me questions, um, ask for clarification as much as you can um, throughout the process. Because the one thing I don't want to do is stand here and just, just talk at you for, for a couple of hours without kind of, you know, setting down, you know, some, some, some boundaries really, in terms of what really works, what doesn't. This is just from our experience. So, like I said, my name, my name is Tom, um, I'm the Vice Principal for Teaching and Learning Assessment up at Rochdale Sixth Form College. We're um, a relatively brand new college, we opened our doors in uh, 2015 to, um, to stop the exodus. Um, and it was a huge exodus of over a thousand young people who, who left the borough to go and study um, A-levels um, in Bury, in Baldwin and, and Manchester. And the, the council, um, I was there from the very start. I, I arrived in Rochdale Sixth Form College um, before we even built it to try and get involved in the planning, in the planning stages. And um, to make sure that what we said we were going to do was born to fruition. So we got the, the Ofsted badge, um, which I suppose is an important one way. We were graded as a, a grade one, um, a grade one Ofsted inspection in 2012 uh, because what we did really, in a nutshell, was we got the right people on the bus in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, teachers and staff. We developed a philosophy of education which I'm going to share with you tonight. That's, that's part of the reason I'm here, is to, is to, to tell you what we did and, and to, to share with you what we believe makes the biggest difference in, in the life chances of a young person and um, the age of 16 upwards. And some things, I, I also to share with you what we removed and chucked out and um, kind of left by the wayside because it didn't have any, any positive measurable effect on the, on the progression of a young person from sixth form college up into its university. And that is the next steps that these young people are going to make. You could argue that there's a different skill set um, required for, you know, from a student year 12 and 13 compared to year, year, year 7 and 8. And you could definitely argue that the, the skills in need need to be it's actually, I think, more important, and we believe it's more important, to skill our young people up. So Rochester Sixth Form College has become, in a nutshell, um, a skills-based <coughs> um, uh, college who develops um, you know, the, the necessary skills that students need to go into university to avoid the feedback we get from universities, like one in five students um, seek counselling, one in 30 students drop out because they don't have things like um, uh, collaborative learning skills or independent research skills or, or, or independent learning skills. So what we do, our package basically involves getting students in the door from day one, making sure we develop the necessary skills through the curriculum, sticking to what makes a difference, sticking to what works and disregarding and liaison with the people who are in front of the, the, the students every day, which is us, you guys, and making sure we move forward like that. The one thing, we, we have an adage up there, it's, it's called simplicity is the ultimate complexity. If something's too complex, or if you've got a system which gets entangled or it's not understood, we, we scrap it. Because uh, everything we have is, is, is understood by everyone, um, and it, it's all really simple stuff. And I can promise you, there's, there's probably going to be nothing I'm going to show you here tonight where, where you won't have thought of, and most of you are probably doing a lot of this already, but um, I think it's always worth discussing and reinforcing and, and looking at um, Listen to what you guys do, because I will learn just as much from tonight, hopefully <coughs> you will from me. But listen to what you do to um, ensure that the young people who enter sixth form here are making the necessary steps with the right skill set for um, up into, into university. It makes sense so far. That's, that's all we're going to do tonight. Talk about skills. And then the second session I'm going to talk about um, removing what I believe and we believe and uh, Ofsted believe is one of the biggest barriers to um, student attainment, and that's um, literacy skills. It's uh, the head v hand grade phenomenon. Have you, have you heard of that before? Well, if you think students in your class, and any class you have, if you think the student who um, orally, in terms of what they can speak and say, lull you into that kind of false sense of um, false sense of ease with the student, where, where you think these are going to be fine in the exam. And then they sit the exam paper or they sit an assessment and what happens then you, you get that, that shock um, on, on your face 
when you realise it hasn't gone as well as you, you predicted the world. Does that, does that make sense? Everyone, everyone has experienced that. So what is it that causes a student to have all this knowledge up in their head? What is it that's stopping them from putting that down constructively on paper? So, so they don't have this mismatch of, of potential head grade versus what you're actually putting on paper. And a lot of people miss really, really simple tricks in bridging that gap. And again, the second session is all about what we've done to make sure that that is not one of the barriers in, in um, academic attainment. It's not perfect. The systems we've got in place, um, I don't think any system is, but at least we're, on, you know, we're working with it. It's, it's, it's part and parcel of our non-negotiables now. We ask teachers to become um, an English teacher before they become a subject specialist. And that's how much that's how much value we attach to developing students and literacy skills and the skills that need, they need to develop over a long period of time. Never underestimate the time frame it will take to um, develop these skills. We think of um, how long it took you to learn. You all drive, you all drive, drive a car. So how long how long it take you to learn to drive a car? Uh, Sixteen lessons. Sixteen? <laughs> that's much more quicker than me. Well done. Sixteen lessons. How long it take you to learn to drive a car? Over a year. Over a year. Me too. Took me a year and a half. I would learn really quickly. In a car, pass the test quickly. So you've been stretching. How many students in the class go on here? Yeah. Sorry, 12 lessons. Just 12 lessons, 12 lessons. 12, lessons. Well, 12 weeks, so. If you think of any. <laughs> the bottom, that would take longer than a year. Yeah, it's longer than a year. So you see a bit of variance, variance in, the, in the group, and some people then got to work very, very quickly. The point is, skills don't develop overnight. <laughs> And we have, um, and it, it is a bit of, it is a, it is a way of thinking, it is a, it is a mindset that some of us um, fall into, and it's, it's a little bit of a trap. We assume too much of the young people who sit in front of us because we struggle often, and we do struggle, to put our expertise and um, feet into the novice shoes of the, the students in front of us. And we assume that they've got all this plethora of skills which is going to just magically develop on their own overnight sometimes. I've seen, I've often been into lessons where, where you'd see one of the targets is to develop the evaluation skills of the students and then you look at the scheme of work and you talk to the teacher and you go, yeah, we do one or two lessons per year on the skills that students need, need, need to um, 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 develop and the strategies they need to impart to make them great evaluators of, of content and context and curriculum so the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Two lessons. And skills take a long time, so you've got to be prepared for front-loaded work in for the long haul, and you've got to be really persistent because in times, in times, as you all know, you all know this, in times you just want to give up when it really comes to trying to fix the mismatch between what's in students' head and what they're putting on paper in their terminal examinations. And we pull our hair out every year, and we look at students, and they become the only ifs. If they only did this, and if only I did that, and if only we taught about this. And so it's trying to limit all them and factors and we've worked relentlessly on that for years so we're coming to the point now where we solved some and more crop up and as it always does but the reason we keep doing it I have to excuse me I'm going to keep walking forward and back to the powerpoint um, education has changed the sixth form and um, the sixth form curriculum is going linear but more importantly the students we're getting um, in our care they're changing I don't know if for those who are teaching a long time um, I'm going to give my age away about telling you how long I'm teaching, but, but for those who are teaching a long time, we'll, we'll realise that the, the, the students themselves and the young people who come into uh, year seven and move the whole way through to year 13, they're, um, they're changing. Have any, any of us noticed the little changes that, that's, that's happening as you move from generation to generation? Or has, what would be the biggest thing to me since, since we went to school? Social media. Definitely. Things are positive or a negative impact? Negative. That's, generally, that's what the research is pointing at. There was a, an interesting piece of research done tail in the last year looking at um, efficiency of a spoken word, for example, and the expected um, vocabulary count of expected number of words a student should be able to utilise in their everyday repertoire of spoken English at the age of 16 should be 40,000 words. And the research found, the grant was done down south, but very large statistical piece of evidence was gathered down there where they said that one in 12 16 year olds had a spoken vocabulary of, of between 800 and 1000 words. So if you think if that's, and, and social media, they were blaming social media, tech speak, um, students not reading anymore for fun, um, 
a, a reshape of, of what's important in, in students' lives, a reshape of career development, etc., etc. There's a whole host of uh, reasons which all shift into to to cause this phenomenon. And yet, us as educators have got to address that while we're trying to get them ready for the, these terminal examinations, which, let's face it, are in sixth form are, are very, very difficult, um, and do require a whole host of of different English skills to be able just to manage the content, never mind developing and understanding the content in the first place. So, um, and that was, that was, like I said, one in 12, 16 year olds. The upshot to that is when these students, um, if they haven't got the, the spoken capacity for um, communicating, understanding, knowledge, etc., you've got to think, okay, job interviews, application forms, exams, because the written, the written content <coughs> always, suffers, always suffers something like times five that. So if you have, um, if you can verbalize, let's say 40,000 words, you can write in a certain time frame five times less based on the content that you know, that's, that's what the, the research is saying. Which is quite frightening really, because what are we trying to get them to do? The whole bottom line of what we do every single day when we're in lesson, all we're trying to do is prepare students for a terminal examination that tests the written skill. That's all we're trying to do. So if we're not focusing every single lesson on trying to get the students to develop these skills over time based on your subject area with the skill set that they need and balancing the content whilst dealing with young people who will come into you with the various issues and problems and etc etc then that's what's making our job pretty tough so it's worth maybe at some point taking a step back and going okay i'm a teacher here's what i am in control of in my classroom here's what i need to do Here's the direction of travel that the students in my care are going to, going to make. Here's the skills they need and here's how I'm going to assess them. Because that's literally all we can do. The problem we face is we're bouncing from one strategy to the next, one policy to the next, from one government body to the next, trying to become a jack of all trades. And it won't work. It won't work. So as sixth form teachers, as teachers who are going to get involved in post 16, you've got to decide what's most important, what are we going to focus on? We have to do it together. How are we going to do it? What's the impact? And, and try and talk, we we'll never stop talking to each other about what works and what doesn't work. So, like I said, another one of the issues with, within education as well is, is we sometimes struggle to put our expertise feet into the novice shoes of the student. And we make an awful lot of assumptions. It was a really interesting, you can organize this for maybe an inset session, an inset day, an interesting task to do to put yourself in their shoes. Is anyone here a physics teacher? No. Good. Um, <laughs> not as good, you know, not physics teacher. There's a, they did say one time, got a, a physics question on a plane, an aeroplane that was travelling you know, across the desert and was dropping a box out. I needed to work out, you know, the, the triangulation of the box and, and the angle it fell at and the distance it travelled and the speed of the plane and then there's all these other questions that built in um, what would happen if the air resistance increases, etc. Et so it's a big, massive physics question. And I dropped this down in front of the teachers at, a, at a, an inside session. I said, um, you've got 15 minutes to, to do that question. And uh, there was no physics teachers in the, in, the, in, in the group. And they were looking at me as if, you know, I'm drunk. Why are you doing this? For? What's the point of this? And I said, try it. I'm trying to do that question. And they all had that look on their face, it's blank. Don't know, don't get it, don't understand. You can see where I'm going with this. I got really frustrated. Um, and I wouldn't give them the answer. And I got even more frustrated. But the point I was trying to make is, that question I gave to teachers in that, in, that, in that session was absolutely no different, no different to the questions that the physics students at the age of 16, studying physics at AS, got during the first week of their um, um, physics lessons. And these students will feel and act and be no different to, to us. There won't be. We've all been to schools, we've all done a little bit of physics previously, and granted it's a little bit longer, it's back longer than, than the students in the physics lesson, but the point remains the same. These students looked at this question, mine went blank, and, 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 and oh, sorry, these teachers looked at the question, mine went blank, and the penny dropped for a lot of people thinking, actually, how do we get across information like this in our subject area? So what skills do we need to do? What do we need to teach our students to, to be able to access a question like that when they see it for the very first time? And of course, we've got talking about creating the big picture context and baselining and making learning relevant through the eyes of the student and making sure that the, um, 
that question was decoded and deconstructed in such a way that every single student could put down, first of all, what they knew about plains and deserts and, and things like that. So you had a big picture buy-in, and that got a discussion going, discussion being one of the most important parts of the learning process. And then to write down in another column all the words that they knew, so, what, so every single word that they knew in the question, including the command and stem word, like explain, describe. Um, a lot of students, as you well know, can tell you, well, if I see the word explain, I've got to use the word because of my answer. Like, okay, so what strategies do you employ? What goes on in your head when you are trying to explain something orally compared to on, on, on paper? And the strategies are often different. So you're trying to, again, <coughs> teach them how to develop a writing strategy, a rubric, a recipe card, call it what you want. And we make our students write our recipe cards. If you see these stem words, this is the actions you've got to take. And finally, the most important column for me is the column where they go, I don't understand any of this. Because all of a sudden, if you're walking around the, the class as a teacher and they can see that I don't understand this column, you can quickly identify where the intervention in class needs to come. And it's, it's, uh, more importantly, it allows the students to drive their, their own progress. And of course, when you see the same misconceptions coming up over and over again, that is easy to put a misconception is bored. During this lesson, here are the misconceptions we've made, and here's how we are going to deal with them before you walk out of the room. And if you teach the same group of course more than once, you just leave them up there. So when they come in, like there's a starter already planned for you. I gave this question to my students last lesson. Here's all the misconceptions. What do you guys think? So you can add to it, take away from it, make progress, learn. This is what I meant by <coughs> this iceberg. This is the educational iceberg. My iceberg has slipped the surface there. How apt. But post 16 education has now gone like this. These, I'm talking about the evolution of education, it's now moved very rapidly forward. In terms of the grades, yes, they're important, but they are not the be all and end all for getting a student into university. And that should be our, one of our sole, one of our sole foci of, of teaching. Either students do, do A level education or want to do A level lessons to get into university or go on and get a job or an apprenticeship, etc. But the grades are becoming less and less and less important. So I'm a scientist. If I want to uh, get a student into medicine, it makes very, very little difference um, if the students I teach in terms of being guaranteed a place in medicine if they get A's in all the subjects. What does make a difference is everything that lies beneath. What skills have I, have I taught them and what skills have I embedded into the curriculum as I've been teaching? Because a medic, we need to have resilience, resourcefulness, be independent, work well in the team, think of jobs like. These are all the additional skills a student will need to have. And some people argue we don't actually have to develop them skills as students. It's just all about the grades and league tables. And we, we are in the wrong business if, if we think currently in the 21st century that's what teaching is all about. Just getting grades, boot them out the door, off you go to university. You're not skilled up, what's your life? What have we done with our life chances? And we have to take a little bit of accountability with making sure that the everything else with our individual students and learning is a messy business. It'll have to be very personal for each and every individual student. It goes hand in hand with the grades. So you're creating a complete package you know, of, a, of a young person who's ready to make the, the next steps up to higher education. And the key to do it is, is it's quite simple. Hook them in. Get them hooked in. Give them a direction to travel. And make sure when you are teaching them that apart from getting their, their buy-in and, and the big picture, connection which you will all need and which you all, all do to keep them in this nice stretch zone here. Does anyone in here do lesson lesson observations? You can do form or informal lesson observations. How do you do? Do you do? Do you ever walk into a lesson and you feel like that? there's a buzz in the air and uh, the lesson free? Teachers have a sixth, a sixth sense. It's a very tangible uh, buzz when you walk into a lesson and, and you know progress is happening because that's what it's all about, progress and learning and keeping students in this in this uh, stretch zone and making sure that you create opportunities for them to get into that stretch zone and plus it facilitates a stretch and challenge uh, strategies. We all know what happens if you push them too far, like us. You put us in the panic zone and we we'll display all these characteristics, stress, fear, tense, hate. We we'll display all these, we're in the panic zone. Plus we also know what it's like when, when, the, when the, the lesson is too easy or when content is too easy. So the key with sixth form teaching, particularly the key with sixth form teaching, is to keep students you know, moving fast. Yeah. Up in Rochdale, I'm not saying it's the right way or the wrong way, all our staff are well versed in this acronym and going places, because we're doing lesson observations and thinking about the um, most important things 
what happened in the lesson. P is for progress, L is for learning, and the extent of the progress a student has made based on their individual target grades. What learning strategy am I going to employ? Are they learning more to the point, and how do I know? A is for assessment for learning. What AFL strategy am I going to employ? Whether it's going to be a peer assessment, a self-assessment. What type of questioning techniques am I going to? What type of questions am I going to ask? More to the point. Are they all very easy questions at a low level? Or am I going to think about blooms and really put people in this stretch zone and make them you know, think outside that comfort zone? C is for core skills. English, 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 English. We are teaching our students to put information on paper. We've got to teach them the correct um, literacy skills which are going to be applicable for our terminal examination. And the second half of this session is looking at strategies to make that happen. E is for employability skills. Do we allow our students to work in groups? Do we promote group work, collaborative learning? Do we um, put opportunities in our lesson where they can independently research something? Where you give them a piece of text that they've got to decode? Um, team with job spec. And that's, that's what employability skills is all about. And S being obviously stretch and challenge. And we ask every member of staff who goes in to do a learning walk, an observation, um, training, coaching, peer mentoring, just to think about that all the time. What is it here you want to focus upon? Or what specifically are you looking for to, to evidence that's happening in, in the sixth form lessons? Um, and it's a useful self-reflective exercise as well for, for us to think. It's all about progress and learning, progress and learning, progress and learning. And the word extent. Right, I'm going to move down through this. I'm not going to set. I talked about the, the, the barriers that exist in learning and the barriers that exist in every single educational institution across this you know, across the country. This is a collection of what people have said. Um, you will have your own. Like we, we come, like Rochdale is, is a different social and economic um, area compared to here. The students we have, we teach just A-levels with some GCSE. So the barriers that we have that exist for learning, maybe or maybe not, a little bit different to yours, but it's worth looking at them and trying to systematically break them down one by one, but prioritize and not don't try and um, you know smash them all at once it won't happen. But just is there anything you want to add, add to that or is there which one of which ones of them do you think is the biggest barrier to stopping young people maximizing their potential? So the biggest three, if you choose three, what would you choose? I was really don't know about that. So if I was a new teacher coming to to here and I wanted advice from you guys to go, what's what's the, what's the three things stopping young people here being, being all they can be, <coughs> something I can, can control? What would you tell me? What would you tell me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Are> you... <laughs> um, initially, mm -hmm. poor development, I would think. Yeah. As a, as a barrier, okay? As a barrier, yeah. Just, do you guys collectively do something about poor developing strategies with, with young people and how to get them on side? And, how to develop, you know, and foster really productive relationships where it's okay to grasp nettles and be, be you know, constructive in terms of criticism. You guys do share that? I haven't had any personal input. I don't know if anyone else has. No, it's a thing that's certainly one. Okay, so it's one of them. Thank you. What do you think? I would pick bullet point number two. Yeah. I think there's a link with um, <coughs> moving from P stage four to P stage five. The way they are shown from stage four is different from stage yeah. five. <clears throat> vision methods and stuff. Like that. Definitely, a lot of students. Do you find? Do you guys find that a lot of students don't know how to revise? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a big problem. Isn't it? A lot of students don't get the differential between um, what these words really. Um, he said to them, "Did you revise last night?" And go, "Yep." Yeah. Yeah. "Did you learn last night?" "Yep." Yeah. "Did you consolidate last night?" "Yep." Yeah. So, what's the difference between revision and learning? And it's just reading, isn't it? 
No, it's still more than that. <laughs> but we, um, that was one of our biggest barriers. It definitely was. With our student intake, they used to, yep. I do think they sometimes use that as a bit of an excuse though, yeah. as well. You know, they, they don't really want to revise. I mean, if they, want, if they revise, they want to do easy things like just reading through their folder. They don't really want to do the difficult things that will actually help them, even if you tell them totally how do you get a student a young person because i remember when i was 16 the last thing i wanted to do mm. was 16 17 18 mm. last thing in the world i wanted to do on a sunny mm. april evening was go home and get my books out i used to kind of fool myself i'm sure we've all been there before where you'd open up you'd read loads you just read your vision guide page by page and you do do some lovely highlighting and you write out some lovely keywords and you close the book and it just went in one ear and out the other i learned nothing and I, I was always left with that feeling at the end of the goal. I just spent two hours, the best part of two hours, reading our vision guide, and I, I'm no better off, so I've just wasted my time. A lot of our students were like that. They, they used to think that revision was just reading from a revision guide or <coughs> trying out a few questions at best. So we had to embed into our personal progress tutor system and our class, every subject teacher, we took the whole inset day in on how to impart study skills and revision skills with students, the difference between revision and learning. And then the lesson, we used to have, um, we got rid of learning objectives. Because learning objectives, what do they mean to a student? They really mean an awful lot. So we tell them the direction of learning that's going to happen in the lesson. But we don't have these kind of, um, in today's lesson, I hate this, I don't mean but I hate where it goes. Some of you will be able to do this. Most of you will be able to do this. You know, that type of thing, you see, you're pigeonholing kids, and you're putting glass ceilings on on what they can and can't do. Um, that's an absolute bugbear in mind. The expectation at the sixth form should be the same for everyone, regardless of target grade. Raise the expectation, raise the bar, put them in charge of the learning process, but teach them strategies to learn. And when you think about it, look at us collectively. Collectively in this room, we've got hundreds of years learning experience between us, hundreds. And yet, again, it's that assumption that the students know how to learn effectively. We know how to learn effectively. So we've been to uni, we've got you a sixth form, we know, so what have we done? And I, I doubt, unless we've got some savants in here, that everybody had to do some form of revision versus learning strategy in uni. Talk to people and develop it. You develop something that's going to be embedded in, in your lessons with the students and um, I promise you it works wonders. And it's almost like you can, you can hear the pennies drop all over the, the room when you explain to students about how to learn best versus how to revise, even down to the conditions that make learning happen best um, in terms of physical environment and, and you know and your emotion states at different times of day and space, air, everything. We consider absolutely everything. Put a little pack together and right, let's teach them this. And um, it seems to be working because we do we do impact measurements on on them. Something I'll definitely send you over if you're interested in. Just a little booklet we give to students it's all this. And the anything else you wanna you wanna go through or do you want to say what ours is? Oh, waste your time, I'll crack on that. I'm like, we still find this a huge problem with students' literacy skills in terms of what they can write on, on paper. Is that a fair point to say about here as well, in terms of what students can write? Um, it's a pity, it, it, it breaks my heart on results day. Really good students, kids, really good students, 100% um, attendance, type of students, really enthusiastic, and you look at their grade going, the work ethic it does not reflect the grade, what they knew in class does not reflect the grade. What are we in control of? But if you read my lesson all the time, there's no attendance issues. So we're in control of the literacy skills that we need to develop with them over long periods of time to maximise their potential. That's literally that with rapport development, making sure they're assessment capable and assessment ready. That's all we can control. Everything else is extraneous. I can't control their home lives. I can't control um, their part-time jobs, if, if, if they're working, you know, if they're living just with mom and have to go out there and some money, I can control none of that. So once I put in, into a circle, you know, into my repertoire, what I can control with the students, it becomes one easier for me and two more manageable rather than having to think about all of this. So what does make the biggest difference in the classroom? If I want to develop just the learning strategies that work best, well here, does anyone, anyone aware of the work of um, John Hattie and, have you heard of John Hattie before? John Hattie is, is essentially a teacher who spent 10 years going out into the field and he's interviewed something like a million students across, across you know, lots and lots of different countries 
and he's interviewed thousands and thousands and thousands of teachers. And he's looking. He's just he's, he's trawled data for ten years to come up with what he calls the things that make the biggest difference in the classroom. Now this guy's going to spend ten years doing this research. His book is fantastic, by the way. I, I well recommend reading it. But I, I was going to share with you some of the things he said, and I'll go back to my original point of why we chucked out things that don't work in the lesson. Um, these are the things. Now the effect size, I'm not going to bore you with the math, math behind it, but basically anything with, with an effect size greater than 0 0.4, and um, there's an equation, so I'm not going to bore you with it, but anything with an effect size greater than 0 0.4 is positive. It has a positive impact on student attainment. When you add up all the positives, you have students maximising their, their potential. So what you're trying to do is utilise the teaching strategies that have the biggest impact on students learning, making progress, and um, getting to where they need to be, as we promised them, and um, when we signed up to this profession, we would we would do. But these are things that some people suggested in, in previous, that's why I stood up here in previous sessions I've run, they, they thought that these factors had a big influence on student attainment. Well, not according to the research, they, they don't. And at class size of one, people, people, I don't know why people think this, they think small class size means easier and students will do better. It's, it's a complete fallacy, they, they never do. Small class size means you've got less marking. That's it. That's about it. Because if I put a teacher in front of five people, five students, 15 students or 50 students, they'll employ the exact same strategy no matter how many people are in front of them. So the class size does not really have any impact on student attainment. That's what it's all about. Learning styles. I hope I'm not going to offend anybody in here. <laughs> I'm going to say now, but there's, there's no such thing as a learning, learning, learning style. There's just learning. That's it. It was a fad uh, that, that the government introduced, you know, in you know, mid, mid 2005 or whatever. People ran with it for ages to the point when I used to go to primary schools to do some training like this. And I used to see little kids run past with uh, you know, big badges on the letter V. And other kids would run past me with badges on. The letter A. Uh, I stopped one of the kids and said, um, What's that mean? What's that mean? He went, and proud as punch, he went, I am a visual learner. That's what he comes out with. And it's like, you're like six. That's your visual learner. Said, What's that mean? And he went, I only learn, six year old, I only learn by looking at pictures. Quote, unquote. <laughs> I get to the classroom then, I kid you not, they had the visual learners in one corner, the auditory learners in the other corner, the kinesthetics that these kids separated out instead of realizing it's all multi-sensory learning and the task the teacher planned she thought she'd be really really clever she, she verbally said this in lessons the next 10 minutes has nothing to do with you quote unquote this is just for the visual learners you guys just hang on a minute out of which in 10 minutes left these six like you know year six students and young people just sitting there going what's going on here learning styles it's we learn in a multi-sensory fashion. We have to, we're programmed to learn in a multi-sensory fashion, not through one filtered channel. So that didn't make a difference. Neither did gender. So what did make a difference? These are all the things that made a difference. But there's too many there. I'm sorry I put all them together off my Looking at all these, this is like you always see, you always see the answer to previous class sizes to make a difference. Look at all in there. If you guys would just pick five, what five things should every sixth form teacher work on to make the lesson better and in order. Have a crack at it. What five would you choose? Remember John Hattie, this guy spent 10 years researching this and we're going to, we, we'll discover it in 10 minutes. It's good to have the evidence, isn't it? So what five things there make the biggest difference according to students and according to teachers and according to learners? Go for it. Um, classroom discussion. Classroom discussion is in the top five. <laughs> what else? Questioning techniques. Questioning technique is in the top ten. But well, it's good, it's there, it's up there. By the way, how many is there? How many things that happen in the classroom can affect student progress? Do you want to guess how many things you actually looked at? You looked at 140. 140 variables in the classroom which contribute to learning you looked at. And you just section them all down into what makes the biggest difference through this research <coughs> and this lovely beautiful equation and the things that didn't make any difference get rid of and all the um, the new kind of learning colleges buzzword down in London all the new learning colleges they're embracing this work and it's having a huge impact because the teachers are sticking to what makes a big difference we are social creatures 
So we are best when we are discussing. So in terms of a teaching practice, what is it? How do we get students discussing in classroom apart from one-to-one Q and A? What else can we get them doing? Really simple. Group work. Group work. So teachers who employ group work tend to tend to, on average, and with statistical significance, students tend to make better progress when they're allowed to talk about the learning, make mistakes, and teachers intervene then with some intervention strategy, whether it be on the board or whether it be something doing the book or whether they bring it back for for. Um, for uh, one-to-ones or boosters. I go on to boosters in a minute. But if you want to look at this, here, here's what makes the difference. The classroom discussion is obviously in there. It's a -O. The biggest factor that affected student progress was the expectation they had with their teacher. Now, if you pull these two together, student expectation and teacher credibility, that effectively means classroom climate. Why is it that some students, and I, I bet you could all do it because I've never been in a place you can't do it, could you or could you not go out of the corridor at any one point, grab a tea, grab a, a, you know, a pupil, then a key says three or four, or a student in, in uh, year 12 and 13, could you stop them and go, name your two favourite teachers? You could, right? Will they have an answer? Yes. Will they work harder for them? Probably. If it comes to a battle between your booster and their favourite teacher's booster, who will they go to? What is it about them teachers you guys need to unearth, untangle, deconstruct, unravel? What is it they're doing? And it goes back to the point you made at the start, one of the most important things, and also one of the biggest barriers to learning, is how to develop rapport with young people. It's so important to look at this and, and to talk about it and go, what do we do to ice break when, we, when we're meeting young people for the first time and get them to really buy into us? But the student expectations of us and the teacher credibility, so that's subject knowledge, enthusiasm, engagement, and how much um, they're perceived to support the young people in the learning and empathise with them. So you can get a second slide up with the empathy. That is, is two of the most important things we can do. The rest involves learning. Intervention. Intervention, I'm going to get to in a few minutes, so I'll talk about that. Classroom discussion, we're social creatures. Let them talk, let them make mistakes. Intervene when you can. Let them make their own progress, teaching the skills of the, of the, not only the exam technique, we don't want to become too examining nation kind of ideology, but also get them focused on them um, talking about their futures, their hopes and fears, the whole package, like I said, if you think of that educational iceberg. Feedback is, inter is an interesting one because feedback is, is, is probably also one of, you know, is, is a teacher's nightmare. There was, um, I've done it at our college. I've done it in some secondary schools in Bradford. I asked teachers for just a two-week period to time how much time they spend marking and um, homework, marking tests, and giving feedback. And everyone, everyone here does that, right? Marks homework, marks tests, gives, gives, gives feedback. How long do you think an average teacher spends? A week. So how long do you spend? A week. On average, do you think? Think about it now. Well, I'm going to teach a sixth form. A sixth form teacher, the average sixth form teacher, spends between 15 and 20 hours per week marking and writing feedback on a piece of paper. This is like a sixth form teacher who would teach an essay based subject, so English law, psychology, history, things like that. A biology, a science sixth form teacher doesn't tend to spend as much, but it's still. Alright. Um, so between 15 and 20 hours. So we're putting all this effort in. 15 to 20 hours of our, our valuable, valuable time putting into creating a red pen culture and putting on some beautiful feedback and making sure that, that we are um, box, box taking. Yeah. Hey, all right. So with all this feedback we're putting in, so we're putting 15 to 20 hours of feed, feedback and marking, etc., etc., in. What do the students get out of it? Do they do what you want them to do based on all this time time you put into it? Or not? Not always, no. No. So is it worth your time putting in 15 to 20 hours worth of marking in? No. Not always. Does everyone agree with that one? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I, I, I agree. Why do we spend so much time doing something we know has mm -hmm. no impact or very little impact on on student attainment? When we give it, this is up here. See this feedback? That has the highest impact on student attainment. 
when the students do it. Not the teachers, the students. So now we go back to that place soccer and think of an AFL strategy. How do we teach the students the skills to become effective markers, to be able to, to develop their own, mark, their own mark schemes, to be able to analyze the mark schemes of the exam, to be able to, again, direction of travel, collaborative learning, sharing marking in classes. Because if we're marking for 15 to 20 hours per week, which we do do, and we give it back, all that happens is to try it. Video your lesson when you're giving out um, um, homeworks or you're giving back um, tests. And just watch what students do. And I agree with you, for the most part, all they'll do is they'll go, an awful, awful lot of red writing on this, this paper. They'll have a quick glance at it. They'll do what we do when we're getting lesson feedback with a grade on it. They'll look at the score, they'll look at the mark, they'll go in the bag, game over. That's it. And unless every single student you have is one of these types of sixth form student that goes, I better act upon my feedback and prove that I've made pro more progress and corrected all my mistakes, unless you've got classes like that, the feedback you do it becomes paper chasing and it becomes operational rather than strategic and you're focusing on the wrong thing. So the feedback, this, this type of feedback here he's talking about is when the students give feedback to the students in the A's and the U. I don't have time to go into it tonight, but um, I'd recommend, and I've talked to Justine about it, and I've talked to um, Kayla, and I've talked, talked to some of the members of staff here about how to create student marking teams um, that you train them how to mark with you initially, so it's very front loaded, um, and then post Christmas, if your student marking teams and your subject there is working, is working well or working the way you want it, let them run with it. Make them mark your homework. Let them be part of the assessment marking. And then a lot of people are going, oh, why? What, why would we do that? It's simple. It's no good you, you it's no good us knowing mark schemes. No good at all. What's the point of me having all this mark scheme knowledge in my head? I'm not being tested at the end of the year. It's much more important. They know where they're going wrong. They know where their peers are going wrong because their feedback to peer to peer will be very, very different than it would be um, should you give it. They need to know what the exam boards think. They need to know what the examiner wants. They need to be analysing the mark schemes. They need to be putting out improvements. They need to be spending the time on it. So at six form level anyway, try getting the marking teams together. And then and just watch what happens. It, it, it will roll by itself. Because then you get students going, how come I'm not part of that marking team? Teach them, train them. Skill them up in how to mark and give active feedback. So developmental. And it's what they need to do anyway before they get into university. Again, we're doing them a disservice if we're greedy with our marking and we put all the marking into ourselves. It's, 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 it's. This uh, reciprocal teaching is straightforward. Peers teaching peers, peers supporting peers, peers involved with you in the planning process. If I want to know how to teach a certain aspect of the course, it's no good me asking someone else my age. I want to ask a student, here's what's coming up in the lessons. How, how do you want me to teach you this? Ask them questions, open up their lines of communication. How do, you, how do you learn best? Do you have any big picture connection with this? Because when I think of, I told you about that physics question, when I think of um, Pythagoras and angles, it's going to be very, very different to what's on, going on in my head, because I'm pulling in years of experience compared to the student. So we have that almost, we've developed these um, in subject areas. Subject teachers now get more and more used to speaking to students before the lessons, certain students to go, here's what's, what's coming up in the syllabus, what do you think, would this work for you, is there any way we can make it better, and involve them in the planning process. And metacognitive strategies is going back to the very start, what I said in terms of um, teaching the difference between revision and learning, what the learning process is all about in terms of what conditions, you know, what conditions can you employ as a collective staff body to make sure that the learning conditions are, are optimal. There's no right answer. Because learning is a very, very messy business that happens obviously inside all our heads. But the important thing to remember in terms of, again, I was talking schemes of work, about schemes of work to, uh, to our teachers here. If you give someone a scheme of work and try to, try to rigidly keep them working on that one scheme of work, learning opportunities will not be created. Schemes of work are there for guidance only. So in terms of developing a scheme of work, why not work on, in this lesson, here's, here's, the, here's what we're going to be doing in all these lessons. And then after that, going, okay, what skill am I going to, how am I going to get across this skill? What's the point of it? Is it, is it testing something that's going to come up in the terminal examinations? Is it developing something within that and um, they're going to need short term, medium term, long term? How am I incorporating employability skills into this lesson, or group work and 
making sure that they're, 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 um, they're working together to suss things out. Who's running and driving my misconceptions? Remember, talking the misconceptions board, which is going to inform my, my intervention. How am I recording this? And the key to all this is just asking lots and lots and lots of questions of the students and let go. They're old enough, old enough now to take, you know, to take responsibility on themselves. Let go of them and, and give them a bit of accountability for their own learning. It's one of the most powerful things we can do is to, just to give them that accountability themselves. But it is front-loaded. It does require a bit of um, work. But like I said, in a very short uh, time frame I'm here, um, if it's anything you want me to send you across, because we've worked on this now for, like I said, I've been working on it eight years, but we've worked it up in Rochester since we opened our doors in 2010. I can send you that stuff. We're we'll taking a quick break, if that's okay with you, in, in two or three minutes. This is the last slide I'll go through here in terms of the different levels of feedback and which ones you want to be utilising. Use them all because you're going to need to use them all. And what you're trying to do is get your students skilled up to end here that's self regulation feedback. So, self level feedback is you'll ask a student a question in class, they will give you an answer, and you will either affirm that the answer is correct, or you go, no, the answer is wrong, let's fix it. So students get that automatic, really quick feedback going, oh, I know this, or no, I don't, I better listen out for the answer. And that's just true, simple Q and A in the lesson. This uh, task level is, remember the slides, the slide I showed you with the comfort zones, the yellow zone we want our, our students to be in. That's about finding their comfort zones. So you set them for a task, you know the direction of travel, you know where you want them to be in the lesson, you give them a task to assess and test that. And what's going to happen then is as you're going around and, and the students are right now, what they can do, what they can't do, what they need more help on, you're finding just where the edge of your comfort zones are. And then you have that in-class intervention to support them as they, as they move forward. The process level, that's the, the one which is applicable. These two, by the way, are the ones we spend less time on despite process level, um, process level tasks being the most common in a lot of the sixth form terminal papers. So process level means you've got this body of knowledge, knowledge and skills, and now you've got to apply it into lots of different contexts and lots of different um, uh, situations and scenarios. And that there is something you can do in groups. Get them talking about it. What goes on in their heads when, when they see a question like that? How are they drawn in their mark scheme terminology and their core words and their, their ideas? Are they writing it fluently? This, this is, you can see the skills are going up as you come through the levels. And finally, that's where you want to get them. That's the, um, I see a question, I can answer that, brilliant. It's, it's where they know what to do next, rather than I'm gonna ask you what to do next. And so if you're teaching a student who's just completed an essay, you've set them to ask, or they've gone through the, the question you've asked them to do in your book, rather than sitting there doing nothing, looking out the window, looking up the roof, texting, whatever they're doing lessons nowadays, the, uh, it's, it's them knowing what to do next to inform their learning because that's the culture you set up from day one. So they're thirsty for knowledge, and they want to please you because of your, the credibility you've developed with them, the rapport you've developed with them, their expectations, your expectations of them. You're finished, are you? So what you do now? How are you going to extend that learning or share it with others? And how about looking at the misconception board? Have a stretch and challenge task on, on a different board in the room or on a different paper that they, they've got to come up and get. So you're keeping them busy all the time. Um, and obviously, the common pitfalls with feedback is, is to not fall into that trap or being self-assured when the self-level, surface-level feedback appears good. And that's what I talked about at the start. That's where students give you loads of feedback orally, and you, you, you are lulled into that false sense of um, security, but they're fine, they'll be grand in the exam, no problem whatsoever, and you leave them. Assume that, that, they, that they don't know and test them on it. Makes sense so far? <laughs> You're perfect. <laughs> After a long, a long hard day. Um, like I said, you just, I'm going to finish that one, take a five minute break. There's other stuff in here. Um, I'll email this PowerPoint over um, and you can obviously you know, I can send your stuff on this or you can discuss it you know, you know, in terms of sixth form teaching, practical strategies to make, to make that, um, make it happen. I know you do the, the purple pen, purple pen, progress. progress. That's what the color, <coughs> we call it the color collective. Purple pen of progress, I like that. Um, <coughs> The other ones I would just give you, the one that's worked really, really well for us as well, we have all these in place. We do, we do all of these now, so we've got a variety of, of 
feedback and learning and progress strategies, but they initially don't like that, but they get very used to it. So you give them a grade or a mark on top of the, the page, because that's where their eyes are first drawn to anyway, but you don't tell them why. And then you set them to go off as part of a homework or a group task or a task they've got to do with certain groups you organize, go find out why. Because you're doing exactly the same thing here as you are with your marking group. You get them used to examiner reports, you can make an examiner report if you want to. You got, they've got to analyze mark schemes, they've got to decide on, on, on whether they're going to award themselves and their peers a mark, who got the mark, who didn't. And again, all you do is you take a back seat and go, I've marked it. But, but the real um, essence behind, behind that is you're getting the students to do what you need them to do, and that's get the exam ready and give themselves feedback for them to develop the skill for them to move forward, compared to you having to do it all en masse with a whole group and potentially miss you know, half the cohort in the big class. Okay. The, we'll take a five minute break, but the next 40 minutes or so is going to be on what we've done to address the mismatch between what students know in their head and students write on paper. So it's just looking at some literacy stuff. And to try and get some ideas off you, because we're definitely nowhere near finished it, but we're working on it all the time. So, is it quarter pass? Okay. And I certainly don't think the transition from end of A levels to university year one is as scary as the jump from GCSE to year 12. And particularly in subjects like maths, computer science, chemistry as you move through it and I think history is a very big jump as well. Psychology tends to be new for a lot of our students, I don't know what, what your experiences here are. So with that with that jump, is that a fair comment to make? The jump from T said four to T said five. Now think of day one and then think of day one when students walk in the door. They've, they've gone from um, a year 11 uniform student and three months later they're all of a sudden in this world of, of depth of where we literally boot them in the deep end and we assume they know this and, and we assume they've, they've grown up massively over that little three month period and we assume they've got all these skills necessary to to just suddenly make progress and more importantly and I know there's some personal experience teaching GCSE in kids this three for ten years you can I think and again feel free just to just to cut me dead here but I can always spoon feed if I needed to a student at GCSE to get a C grade if I needed to. You know them hardcore cases you're going to go like right, sit down and tell you how to get a C. I can always do it. I wouldn't have cut the hell's chance of doing that with A level um, science. And I doubt any of your A level specialisms can be taught in a kind of a save C grade strategy. Does, does that make, make sense? Mm -hmm. Therefore, you've got to think okay, if they're truisms, the real life occurrences, then how do we stop that from happening and what do we work on that's going to have the biggest impact? We know that the teaching strategies have the biggest impact and that's the classroom discussion, the credibility group or metacognitive strategies, the feedback process when the students are doing the feedback. In liaison and with us, don't get me wrong, students will not be able to give feedback to students after one lesson. It's a, it's a front-loaded skills development program that you've got to put in place and teach them. If you want to put down on your marking and the amount of time you're spending on things that I think teachers generally cost the world, I would say, is the bugbear of our profession. Because if you think of what a, what a utopian profession would be, well, in my eyes it'd be no marking. If I had to do no marking whatsoever, my life would be peachy as a teacher, but unfortunately I can't. So what I'm trying to do, and, and may, maybe share with you guys, is come up with ways to make life easy, make life simple, um, and, and, and especially at sixth form level, get the students doing what they need to do to make the progress, not what you need to do for them, because otherwise you're back in that spoon feeding mode, and believe you me, you will not spoon feed a grade at, um, at this level. You, you know this, you will not spoon feed a grade in maths, for example. You can tell a student, just do this and get a C. You can't. So, we worked a lot on literacy in the classroom as a caveat, a lever, to um, move students forward and to teach them the skills that are going to need for the term and examination. And what we did, we've been doing this now for a couple of years. <coughs> Again, it's that, that truism we talked about at the very <coughs> start of the presentation where um, there was mismatches, absolute mismatches between what a student can say, what's up in their head, what's in their long-term memory, how they share information with peers. I've seen students peer teach 
as good as I do in certain aspects of biology. I, blown away, just taking a back seat and went, wow. And what's more is they dealt with the misconceptions I didn't even think of while they were doing it. And these same students who could teach with that level of expertise were going to see grades in the exam. And when they used to analyze their paper, they used to go, they make a mistake. That, that's a literacy mistake. That's a, an English mistake. That's a, you know, a misinterpretation of context. So like, we come up with, we said, well, this has got to stop. Because as, as a professional who works hard, we work damn hard in our profession. Um, We've got to do something to make, like I said, life easy. We'll get that reward at the end. Um, and we, that I should put up there as just a reminder for, for myself to say to people that at this level, memorizing mark schemes just simply won't be enough. We're doing the young people in our care a massive injustice. If it was the case, just print all the mark schemes out, we're redundant, give it to them, let them sit in the exam. So, this is my the umbrella, not very good, but um, this should contain, hopefully, um, all the areas that you would think of would be a pitfall in the assessment in terms of English. So if you look at it, and I'll, I'll talk about science first and then I'll, I'll ask you guys. As a science teacher, I know, I know my heart and soul from experience and talking to students and marking their assessments um, and them telling me what, what they see when they're marking all the homeworks that this side of the umbrella in terms of English skills is an issue. The students struggle sometimes to identify command words and questions. They know, like I said at the start, they know what explain means, they know what discuss means, they know what describe means, but they don't have a strategy, an actual put pen to paper strategy, to overcome it when they're asked in question. And what would tie if someone asked them to describe and explain, suggest and analyse, which makes it even worse at our level. So we consciously made a move every single lesson. Not only did we focus on a specific command word, but we, we focus on the techniques to make, we focus on techniques that the students would need to have in their repertoire to tackle um, on paper the requirements of the exam board based on that command word. And we just made these little recipe cards. And again, I'm just speaking on it from a science point of view. Every time you see this command word, what's it mean on the right side? Here are the strategies, here's what you need to do. And we analyzed paper after paper after paper to try and find as many questions we could possibly find and put them in a booklet for the students to go, there's your explain command word booklet, let's work through this, what skills do we need to answer this? And the same for describe and the same for suggest, because it requires a different writing style. I also found as a scientist that the students sometimes didn't comprehend text. So I'd ask them the question orally and I'd reframe some of the words. Just big, you guys have done this, right? And the students go, ah, bang, here's the answer. Here's the keywords, all the marks access. You know, fantastic. You put the question down with a little bit of text in, and suddenly you're like, can't do it. Because there'd be a word somewhere in that text which would just troll them. And I'm finding out new words every single year to troll students. So we keep it lost rate of anything. This is why I ask them to keep this tracker sheet. Everything you don't understand goes in that tracker. It's all information gathering for me. It's all about sharing information with our students as well. And the reason we do this as a student um, who speaking of medicine in the previous session, was one mark off getting an A, which would have gotten directly into medicine, you could do after a gap year. One mark off getting an A and got his paper back. He was absolutely distraught. And a question came up, it was a five mark question, and he got zero out of five in it. And I didn't think about it, I just reframed the question. I went, you got no marks in that question there, what, what happened? And I asked him the question, he went, and you could just see this look of horror in his face because he absolutely knew the answer. There was one word in the question which just got him stuck. And that word was, I couldn't believe it, and, you know, an 18 year old was hedgerow. So we have this thing now up in science called the hedgerow strategy. He didn't know what hedgerow meant. And because he didn't know what it meant, we had taught him enough literal resilience to get through it. And kind of to, ah, what, what do you do when you don't know a word in the exam? Don't let it stop you. Stick with it. What strategies do you need to apply? We come up with a whole new host of strategies to get students over that. So it never, never happens again. Learn from your mistakes, don't you? So if we work on that, if I want to work on text interpretation and comprehension, I won't do it once, once a week or once a month. I'll do it every single lesson. So every single lesson, in terms of assessment strategy, in terms of teaching strategy, in terms of core skill development, analyzing progress and learning, I will have something that tests this every single lesson. Because that, for me, is where students fall flat in my examination. The other one is application of knowledge in unfamiliar context. So, AQA exam board we have with science, sir. 
they're a bugger for putting down random animals onto these hand paper and random stuff which even the teachers are going, huh? And then even we're going, I've got to show some resilience here and get through this. And we joke about it, but, but every lesson we work on these. So that's for science. Now all this English and development of English skills only happens when you teach the students knowledge and skills in the first place. So this is, these are the barriers that exist potentially if the students, once the students have the knowledge in the first place. So you've, you've taught them the knowledge, they get it, they've got the skills, they use the, the core words effectively. Now it's like, okay, which one of these is, is stopping you getting the grade you're supposed to be getting? At least your MTG grade. And so our feedback, if teachers want to do feedback, and the feedback we do in our marking groups is we code where the students have got wrong. So we have more bespoke intervention sessions, which is working on what really makes a difference. The one thing that doesn't work, it work to a certain extent, but it won't be the extent you want, is the en masse turn up to an intervention session. You, you will, because the students love their teachers. You will have 25, 30 students roll up with no problem whatsoever, and sit in front of you and listen to you, and, and probably reteach. A lot of people reteach the same thing over and over again, and hope they can you know, shove the information in, if you want a better word, by just saying it more and more and more and more, and more times. Maybe if, if that was us sitting in there, if I don't know something, I don't understand it, or have no big picture connection to it, or it just makes sense to me. You can tell me a million times, if you say the same thing over and over again to me, I ain't getting it. So we have all these booster sessions running, which did just that. Lots, lots of students turn up, pen, you're eager, pen ready to go onto paper, just waiting for that little nugget of information they needed to make, to make progress. And they could be there for an hour, and with five minutes relevance. And teachers, in their good nature, because they care passionately about their students, will do this over and over and over again, rather than thinking of simpler ways of doing it, more smarter, save time, save energy. And that is to forensically analyse what is it that's stopping the students from getting their grades. Nine times out of ten is one of these. And inviting students to an intervention session which works just on that. And the starting point is to get to know our students, Astutely marked assessments to go, this student is making a lot of mistakes when they're trying to apply knowledge in a familiar context. That's my intervention session is going to be on slide. I'm just making that a little bit more pertinent and relevant for us because we do put an awful lot of effort in. I found that psychology, are there any psychology teachers? Tim, that's one. I find that in psychology, the big issue students were having was a combination of these three here review. In other words, they'd write a big essay and read nothing. Wouldn't read back, sort of waffling basically. Some of them had a very slow, they just couldn't write fast enough. So you gotta go, I'm gonna go, get over that one. The strategy can be applied to overcome slow pace and writing skills. And the other one was, um, in terms of processing language skills, the, the way they put information on paper wasn't fluent. One idea didn't lead into the next in a nice fluent manner. And I'm sure you've come up with students who, who do that. So we addressed, these, these things here in psychology. One of the simplest things we did to kind of flag it up as re, re, like maybe you didn't find review as big as we did, but one of the biggest things we did to flag it up is to do um, a little strategy called a plus five. And all that is, is if we were giving a student a 40 minute assessment, at the end of the assessment, we'd ask them to stop, put the pens down, generic conversation with them about um, how to find assessment, how are you, type of, type of conversation. And then you go, right, about five minutes, different color pen, go back to the start, read what you've wrote, and every single place you want to make an adjustment or scribble something out, do it. If it was an hour test, we'd give them 10 minutes. If it was a 40 minute test, we'd give them these extra five minutes, just to review what they wrote. And we found, long -term, long -term, it was a long term study we did, and just with the psychology department this, on average, this is on average, um, students per class, on average, were gaining at least two extra marks. So you think, is it really worth that strategy to get two extra marks? And then we start looking at how close students were to the grade boundaries. We had a whole host of students who were either one or two marks off, and they're the ones that kill me, the ones who were one or two marks off the next grade up. And in terms of Alps analysis, then all of a sudden teachers, in terms of their classroom performance and how we make them accountable for it in terms of performance management, are suddenly moving from one band into the other. Just by simply asking the students, read what you write. And they focused on it for, an absolute, you know, for a whole year. What they did as well, we asked them to do test this writing speed out for essay based subjects. So, two things you can do. 
you can get a, a stopwatch and you can give everyone a big massive piece of text which they couldn't possibly um, finish all over the class and then ask them all to read this will, show, this will give you a very quick indication of how different students are because reading and writing skills go hand in hand processing skills go through reading skills etc etc it's all part of the literacy strategy ask students to read for two minutes stop and ask them to count how many words they read in two minutes Actually, the differential sometimes can be hundreds, hundreds. And will that affect their examination performance? Absolutely. Um, is there something we can do about it? Absolutely. You've got to develop the reading skills. And over time, you keep doing that measure to see are they improving in terms of, in terms of what they can actually read. Lads, be careful with because when lads read fast, they do something called, they do, um, they skip. Lads are, 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 are no, I do it. We all do it, as well. we all do it to some extent, but young 16, 17, 18 year old lads, when they're reading large bodies of text, jump words to get through it, because they don't enjoy the process. Come up with a strategy that makes them go word for word, whether it's use their finger, use a pen, something <coughs> simple. Everything you do in terms of developing these skills will, will make a difference. The same with this. If I want students to write an essay in science, if I, if I say to, to a student, 17 year old, you're going to write me a two page essay now on photosynthesis, they probably either walk out or get sick because it's not going to happen. I'm going to teach them how to do it. So a really good a, a, a strategy I would suggest to do is in an A-grade essay for photosynthesis or an A-grade essay for um, milligram or an A-grade essay for, for, for whatever your subject area may be, why not write out the 20 or 25 questions the students would have to answer to, to get an A-grade? And then once they've put their answers in underneath all, all the questions, rub the questions out or get them to transfer it again on a piece of paper and compare that then to a model answer and then finally that last piece of paper so you're triangulating the process of all the time they can do this for homework and um, the last piece of paper is the differential between the two what what's an A-grade answer look like here in the mark scheme compared to the model answer you've just given me compared to what I wrote and how many questions did I answer correctly what do I need to do it informs intervention um, and again, a lot of um, the psychology staff have employed that strategy in saying, rather than saying to students, if you're writing two pages, they're saying, you're going to answer five, 10, 15 questions, 20 questions. The students see that as being chunked and much more manageable, even though they're, they're, the output will be the exact, exact same. And we train them how to do that and how to teach each other this strategy. It's a really interesting strategy. I'll give you a quick um, indication of the importance of review. These come from personal statements that, had we not read them, would have been sent off. I like the bottom one. Hope to hear from you shorty. <laughs> but we flag this up with students all the time. The importance of just reading what you write. And we've all done it, I've done it. I've sent out an email in a rush, didn't read what I wrote, and I wrote some rubbish in, in the middle or misspelled something horribly obvious. But um, it's, it's a skill that they need to know because, like I said, university is that one shot for these, these guys, and just one shot if you want to get to the you. And then um, things like this. I used to sit on a university panel that I used to interview and, and um, look at personal statements and references. And if it came to a split hair decision between one student and the next, and I saw something like that, so I mean, does it influence? It does. It, that would <laughs> definitely <laughs> thinking what's going on here first of all it's certainly my first interview question <laughs> but it, it is it, it is important it's important for you to to sit down in subject subject teams do it individually first for you personally and then to your subject teams and then to the, all your 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 your, your sixth form um, all your sixth form teachers and, and get them seeing it from the same hymn sheet in terms of it is an issue, it is a problem, but which one of the, the, that literacy umbrella is ours? And how are we going to move that forward? And you won't fix all eight in, in, in any quick measure of time. It's going to be a prolonged process, it's going to be a painful process. Um, you've got to skill the kids up with this and make sure that they're, they're developing the skill as it's most pertinent to your paper. And to cut a long story short, is, 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 is teach them what they need to know let them develop the skills so they can really, really flourish. Just an example of what we did last year. We got um, all our, you know, on AQA you can do a post paper analysis and find out where your students went wrong. <coughs> well, that's where they went wrong for us. Despite us doing this literacy strategy all year, 
there's still some students do not this misrepresentation of knowledge in terms of understanding the question types. The one certain and the one um, uncertainty in education, perhaps it's going to always change, is um, English and English skills and, and students' ability to effectively <coughs> communicate on paper. That issue will never, never, never go away. You can change socioeconomic circumstances, you can change the physical environment of the room, you can change your, your curriculum, timetable, you can change on your own. But in terms of the students' level of English skills, and that being an issue, it's stopping them being all they can be. It's unfortunately not going to go away. But it doesn't mean we don't do something about it at every single opportunity we have. In fact, more so, it needs to be probably one of our sole focuses, as well as looking at what makes a difference in the classroom compared to what doesn't. And then to look at um, look at strategies that's going to work best for you to make life easy. So I said at the start, simplicity is the, is the ultimate complexity. I doubt there's abs I doubt there's anything I've talked about up here tonight, which you guys didn't already either know or have tried. Um, the one other beauty about education is Rollins to that um, nobody's reinventing the wheel. All we're doing is we're adding more spokes to the ones that already spin. Um, for you guys, it's a lot of kind change um, collectively. You know, the more we work together to work on these, the, the much, much better and faster that spin will be because everyone's got expertise in this room. Um, there's no oracle with any one of these. If there was, it'd be a quick fix, wouldn't there? Um, that we were shocked at, just to make a point of that lack, lack of confidence. We didn't see this one coming, and all that was here was um, we looked at some questions, and students would get one out of three, two out of four, three out of five, and yet we knew, we knew in our heart and souls that we were really good students. So when we talked to them, when we got their papers back, we went, what happened there? And the worst thing, the worst thing they can do to us is to tell you the answer, and they go, oh, it's this. Why didn't you write them that then? <laughs> and they go, I thought they were wrong. And it just, just didn't seem they, they thought because they didn't want to be wrong. Girls, this was a huge problem with the girls. Lads, lads went for it. Don't care. I think, you know, I'll I think the chance is 50 50. Girls, we found um, in biology particularly, if they didn't know something for sure, they wouldn't second guess it. So for them, it became a limiting factor in their, in their attainment. Luckily, not, not, the effect wasn't as large as um, it could have been. But um, it certainly worried us enough to go up this year, make sure they're, they're working on and um, make them put it down on paper and give them that security blanket with it. It's okay to be wrong. Um, I've seen, I'm sure you've seen as well. I will, um, I will take to task a teacher if I walk into their room and do lesson observation or I've heard from a student, I'll take to task an adult who lambastes or completely publicly embarrasses a student for being wrong or making mistakes or for not being bright enough or not being quick enough and it's it's just it's unethical um, for want of a better word and I think I think if we had if we adopt that mindset um, with all our students will then we've lost before we even start. So um, make sure that your 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 room so just leave you one piece of advice tonight. Make sure your your room is, is a place where where um, there's no failure, to use an, L an LLP adage, there's no failure, it's just feedback, and it's just learning, it's just making progress, and adopt a growth mindset rather than that pre-assumption of a fixed mindset where students come in and go, you will never be. Um, and try and encourage each other never to, to um, I'm just trying to think what makes the biggest difference for us in terms of no glass ceiling. Try and never say, this is only for the A grades, A grade students. If I was sitting in there, I'm not believing it. I'm going to switch off right now. It reminds me of the primary school when they went, This is only for the visual learners. Learning is learning, and good teachers could teach in a barn anyway. So, <coughs> so I'm going to move on to this. Where is it going to? Talked over like this one the impact. Put a strategy in place, talk to each other. Decide on which of the parts of literature and you're going to work upon that will have the biggest impact quickly on your students, and then go, okay, how do I know this is going to have any form of impact whatsoever? The obvious answer is, is you, you're already thinking it, is whether well, grades will improve, or the percentage pass rate will improve, or the number of students getting an, an A grade will improve, um, or the number of students who um, um, are moving up through, through the the skills will improve. So you've got to have some form of tracking strategy and then 
to measure impact at the, at the end. The way we do, I'm not saying it's the right way, I'm not saying all oh, Rochester Six Farm College doing this, it's, it's perfectly good. It's not, but, but the, way, the way we do it is um, we adopt what we call a feed forward policy. And I purposely use them words feed forward, probably because we're so sick of getting feedback that it's all the feed forward it makes more sense, isn't it? Because you're always trying to move, move, move forward. And we put markers in the sand in terms of what it should look like in a month, in a half a term, a term by the end of the year. And that's how often we measure impact. We assess every two to three weeks, by the way. Um, so we are absolutely forensically analysing student development over microcosms of time. So we just have a, a much bigger picture of their, their progress. And then, and so we can intervene much, much, much quicker. And the intervention is, is more pertinent. Um, here's some of the things we've done to measure, to measure impact. All our lesson observations, by the way, um, have that common theme of how are English skills being imparted in the lessons? How are English skills being developed? More importantly, what English skills are being developed? Do students know that they're working on these specific English skills? And how is that being tracked, tracked and monitoring? Um, we also have literacy workshops. That's how serious we're taking it this year. They work on the specific skills of that, of that um, literacy umbrella that I showed you at the start. And then attendance to the literacy workshops is, is compulsory. It's not drop-in. The subject teachers will, will move students into these workshops if what they're trying, first of all, in terms of intervention, is not working. And we have, we have what we've done basically, is we've identified every one of these on the umbrella, and we trained or got people who are experts at developing these skills, and there are people who run the, who run the workshops. And it doesn't have to be in the subject there either, because it's a skill that's cross-transferable into every single lesson. Um, just looking at this, like, so I've come from a science, science background and I've talked a little bit about psychology. In, in maths, for example, um, I know you don't think this, but a lot of maths teachers think English literacy, not for me. Um, it just has no relevance for me, when ironically one of the biggest barriers we found in maths, um, certainly in the local secondary school, was, the, was, was exactly that. They didn't have any um, um, strategy to combat the difference between students being very good already with their maths and being able to do it on the board and interact with whiteboard, and then it came to paper and all that kind of thing, didn't it? So, which one of them do you think? If you were to choose two, which one of them is, is the most important for maths that you would want to work on all the time? Say so the language skills and processing. Yeah. And they need to be able to, what to do, what the questions are going to do. Um, Well, the application knowledge in an unfamiliar context. In unfamiliar context. Mm -hmm. do, um, do maths or do, do anybody do um, recipe cards for students? Like, no. We do, we, we use the analogy of baking a cake a lot in, in lessons where the ingredients for success are, and it sounds awful primary school, but they, they quite like it, especially when we talk about the type of cake. But the ingredients for success will be um, and then, like any recipe, you know, making a cake, you have to follow it step by step. So we, we make them write all these cards out, whether it's we want them to know step by step what a theory is, or step by step what a technique is, or step by step how to overcome a pitfall. So kids will walk around with these different coloured recipe cards. So if I'm doing a question, I'm trying to develop their application knowledge in unfamiliar context, out comes the recipe card, this is how you do it. These are the skills you need to do, and we'll identify, we'll add to these as the year goes on, because obviously we'll find out new things about the way students process as we, as we go. And sometimes it's as simple as, um, if, if a word appears in the text that you don't understand, and it's going to stop you answering the question, or even attempting the question, scribble it out, take it out. Because nine times out of ten in biology, I don't know about different subjects, that word is thrown in there the red area. It just, it's just there to, to build up bulk, like hedgerow, for example. So when they scribble it out, it's like, oh, I can suddenly do this. But it's, it's whatever strategy works for them, and these cards will, will become populated with more text as the year goes on. And then when you get to, to you know, post-February half-term, then you can see the students are taking out less of one coloured card, card and more of another. So you can start to see how the curriculum is getting more difficult. Your intervention has got to change then. Your, your booster session has got to change. The way you teach, maybe, has got to change. And bearing in mind that what you're trying to always do is give them direction of travel for the, to get them to the terminal examination paper. 
Um, so that's does that matter? Like that's maths. That's that's science. Um, it, psychology is not. Do you guys is is it the same as us? You suffer from students not reviewing properly. The writing speed is not fast <coughs> enough, and then they don't put the stuff down in a logistical order. I think the process it and the language goes in the process and it means something that um, you struggle with. At A2 I find <coughs> writing speed, but I also find it's difficult for AS, um, application of an unfamiliar context, trying yeah. to put, you can teach them the theory, but it's the skills that need to then um, engage that into a new source, but I find they struggle with quite a lot. We spent a lot of work this year building up on the <coughs> skills to apply that to an unfamiliar situation. And that's, that's all you can do. Yeah. That, that's a cracking strategy to do, is look at what, what's your biggest issue and just mm -hmm. work upon it lesson after lesson after lesson and make it become part of their cultural learning process, for want of a better term, that it's just it's something that's, it, it goes. And just like us to go back to driving a car, I have huge issues, <laughs> some of you guys, my huge issues doing parallel parking when I was learning to, uh, to drive. What do I have to do? I have to practice it over and over and over and <coughs> over and over again and fail it and fail it and fail the test. But fail the parallel parking over and over and over and over again until I got to a point where I can just do it. It became part of my, my driving behaviour. Um, although I do avoid it when I can. But it becomes part of my driving behaviour now. Just like you want that to become part of a learning behaviour with students where it's n the negative impact is completely negated. Um, and then you move on, to, you, will, you will find, when it's not that, it's this, it's not, you will bounce around this umbrella quite a lot, but it, it's important to have a starting point and make sure everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet and, and to, to move, um, so, so when students move from one lesson to the next, they understand that teachers are trying to do the same thing, which is skill them up, get them ready, make them more independent, make them more collaborative, you know, like things we, we, we talked about basically. Does anyone else teach something different where you think there's, there's, there's a different area we could try and work on? I think modern languages, Sam's a modern languages colleague, I think review is probably the one that I'd pick out. Definitely with the essay. Yeah, and essay translations. Translation. Yeah. translation yeah. And the idea of building in that plus five, plus, plus, ten. Five, plus ten, I think we should trial that. that when the students the find out the benefit of that, and they do, mm. it, all, it automatically becomes part of their exam technique. Mm. Uh, we've advised students, I don't want to dangerous this game of play or not, but I need, I need more time and data to prove it, yeah or no. I said to the students, if you're an examiner, it goes five minutes left. Yeah. I think at that point in the paper, statistically, in biology, because you're at the hardest section, you're much more likely to pick up one or two marks extra by going backwards go back rather than way. finishing the last yeah. question. And I think it's working for us, but I need more data to, to mm. prove it. So, but they, they do it. Um, um, and particularly, I remember last year, last year's biology paper on the AQA, the last one, which was horrific. I'm so glad I did it because they would have been sat looking around blind for, for ages. They would have needed more time to finish it. So, mm -hmm. five minutes left, get back, review, and try and play the, the, the statistics game. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of a theory of review then as well. Oh, sorry. Because there's quite a theory of review. And I know as a student, I keep that, you know, going back over you in case, yeah. you know, no, yeah. I keep, but they have to learn to bite the bullet. I think they find it so strenuous as well that they, they can't find that last bit of energy yeah. to go back to go through. Back. Yeah. It is, um, it is um, something that you've got to train them to do. They, don't, they won't do it naturally because, like us, they don't like them. If I said to you, like, we're to your performance management review to me, it's just it's a connotation mm -hmm. that review process and review, what the, the review semantics means in, 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 our, in our environment. People saw that, don't they? Because they find mistakes, they find errors, it puts them down. It's, you've got to retrain them. I think sometimes they also think, I've done the work, and this is something extra rather than seeing it as yeah. part, part or an integral part of the work they're doing. The students have benefited most are the ones who, who are on to find mistakes when they go back, mm -hmm. and then for you to kind of praise them and go, you're not going to see the because you've done this process. And other people, if you publicly praise them and try and get across the importance of it, if you think it's important enough to spend every lesson on, or certainly a large proportion of your lesson on, go for it, just do it. Um, you know, you're the one that's got it. Like I said, they're the ones who've got to develop the skills, not you. And any help we can, we can, um, we can give them is, it will be good. Near the end, guys. Um, you know, thanks a minute for listening. This, this land. Like I said, I sat with sat in more sat for a hard day's work of um, you know, two hours and lashing stuff out. Here. And I hope it's been helpful. But um, 
we, we use this top line all the time. In terms of English skills and literacy, is, um, is make the implicit and explicit. Make it absolutely obvious to the students what they need to do by developing, deconstructing um, strategies, teaching them skills, making sure that um, they know what to do when they don't know what to do. That's the key. Also, to go back to something I said earlier on, it's also the reason many people, um, it's also the reason a lot of students, we talked about the dropout rate from university. They drop out because they don't know what to do when they don't know what to do. Us, we're different. We're adults. We are more robust. So if I've got an issue, I've got enough independent um, resourcefulness to go and go, I'll seek help. I'll go and ask someone who I know has, it seems like such an obvious thing to do. But to a 16, 17 year old, pride gets in the way. Sometimes fear gets in the way. They just won't do it. So it's important that we, we make it happen, sometimes on their behalf, until it becomes part of their learning um, and behavior. But just to finish up on some of the things we've worked on in terms of literacy, and I'll give you a little flavor of what worked best and what didn't. We talked about the, the literacy umbrella and the, the eight barriers that exist in terms of what the students need to be able to do and the skill set they need to have to put pen to paper at the end and justify what's in their head on paper so there's no mismatch. So in terms of reading was one of them, the students' reading skills. And I talked about giving out a piece of text and asking them, giving, giving the whole class a piece of text in your subject and area, obviously, that they couldn't possibly finish. Ask them to read and then you know, time them for one minute, two minutes, whatever, whatever you want, 90 seconds. And ask them to count how many words they, they have read. And then all you would soon see when it comes to examination technique, if you were to give that them students who have a much slower reading pace, if you were to see that, um, if you were to give them an assessment very quickly after working out this process, you would see the correlation. Slow reading pace means people don't finish the paper. It's going to affect their grade or they rush one or the other to try and get through the paper. And all these is part of you developing their exam technique. So to try and improve that, we employed three different reading strategies with students who we identified um, as part of our literacy focus to go into the literacy intervention group to work on these skills. And we found these were the three that worked best for us. Ask your students first to skim read, the lab to talk really well with the lads. Um, then we talk in the process of how to scan text for keywords. So if I'm teaching biology again, they will know all the keywords. That would be part of the knowledge and skills. They will know the keywords. So we talk to scan for them. And as soon as they saw a keyword, that's where the mark scheme answer came into my head. So to give you an example, um, every time a student saw the word mitochondria, in, in, a, in a piece of text. It's like a call and response. The next thing they'd say is, oh, mitochondria, energy, in the form of ATP, Christe, and nine times out of 10, that will be part of the mark scheme. So you're teaching them strategies to kind of overcome this fear of, of reading. And skimming and scanning are two important techniques. They would definitely need them in university. They would definitely need them if they're running out of time in the exam. They would definitely um, need them when they're, when they're doing some uh, uh, revision. And then independent research, we were taught was to this was the biggest factor out of the three that improved um, not just their reading strategies, but their um, vocabulary and the extent to which they can articulate biological understanding. We did a lot of this in biology first. Um, and with the independent research, we used to give them all something they were interested in, personalise the task, ask them to go away, give a week to do it. Before they gave us the independent research, they would have to get it peer assessed by two other people who would ask them questions about the terminology and Remember them sheets I told you about where to write down, I know lots about this, but I still don't know stuff about this. So even that had a, an element of intervention attached to it. But uh, to go back to that, that research piece I was telling you about where students, um, 1 in 12, 16 year olds, are working in copy of 800 words, we have a lot of students like that. We found this, getting them in control of the learning process by asking them to do this independent research was working wonders with their, certainly their biological um, um, vocabulary, which of course will add to the word repertoire that we use in the terminal examination paper. I've already mentioned about um, writing and ways to um, encourage students to write essays, particularly essays, where you can maybe scaffold and chunk it down to answer these 20 questions, you can answer all these 20 questions in the, in the you know, um, demonstrating your knowledge and skills, well, you're well on the way to getting an A grade. So what is an A grade? So once they do that, remove the questions, compare and contrast. And so we did a lot of training in students in lessons. I know it sounds really patronizing, um, 
but again, it avoids that assumption we make that in in, in June, July, and August, the students will grow up and are, and are, and are English experts. They're not. You have to avoid that assumption that they, they suddenly know how to write fluently like the way you do. So we got them to do long sentences, short sentences, and um, we asked them to come up with as many varied sentence starts as they could. It's obviously going to help with personal statements as well, and you cast some job applications. And we made that part of every lesson as well in terms of I remember I said we don't really use <coughs> learning objectives, we just use learning. This is the skill we're going to develop today to, to, um, to inform your, your learning. So this worked best in subjects like law, history, essay based, where the very daunting task for a student who's 16, 17 is to write a two to three page A4 essay. They don't like that. So you've got to have some ways of going, let's vary the writing style, let's, let's teach you how to process different things. Let's teach you the difference between a long and a short sentence, how to maybe combine ideas using connectors. And, and we taught them this, literally ad verbatim. Spelling strategies, what words look like, uh, sound like, etc. A lot of students, again, to go back to that lit literacy resilience, and in terms of if they couldn't spell a word, remember I was telling you about the girls who were afraid to make mistakes in the papers, and the students who knew the answers, but because they couldn't spell it, they didn't want to show themselves up, inverted commas, um, in front of the examiner, we leave it out. Couldn't spell. So we we're teaching them how to um, get around, uh, get around difficult words, and um, how to uh, break deconstruct words down into, into smaller parts, and um, how to use the words in their real life context. We used to get them to use them in class. We had words of the week. We had all sorts of things to, to improve the students' um, um, spelling strategies. Because whilst I understand in, in some GCSE subjects, spelling, punctuation, grammar. It's not penalised, I understand that. But when it comes to A level, and obviously you can see how, how spelling, grammar, and punctuation is going to have a negative impact on, on their attainment over time, especially when it comes to applying for university. Because again, I, I keep saying we're training them to apply to university, and also not to be all and end all. Some will go on to do uh, you know, vocational courses and apprenticeships and, and work gap year. But the majority will be applying to university. And without, without accurate spelling, grammar, and punctuation, Again, we're doing them a, a literacy disservice. Um, the examination scenarios, same thing. We used to get them to come to questions. So we used to say, right, in, in um, law this week, here's the case study you're studying. Go find me three examination questions that's, that's tiered. There's something you think that's easy, something that's medium, something that's more difficult. Bring them to lesson. Let's discuss why you said one's easy, one's medium, one's difficult. And again, in a form or intervention sessions. And the students were really, really good at going away and going, I think this would be an easy question because the STEM word is describe. I know the strategies to describe. Here's what I would do, and then here's the answer to the question. Get consensus, move on. Why is that a medium difficult question? What would be the pitfalls? And eventually, we've got students doing that and downloading the examiner's reports to read them and to pull out the core points, core learning points to share as part of the learning process and the lessons. Because the one thing you should be doing in sixth form lessons, like I said, is let go of it. And make sure they're developing the learning skills and that you're not trying to try to try to spoon feed them. And finally the modeling exercise is dead simple. It's um if you find a crack and answer, you won't do this, I know you want this. If you find if you find a crack and answer, model it. Pull it apart and go, why is this an absolutely fantastic answer? Make sure it's the students. Then look at some analysis to go, that would be fantastic if we get the whole class to do that peer assessment strategy we talked about. And finally you add your two pence in and going, here's what I do. And let's let's you know marry them all up together, photocopy them, give it to them and off they go. Um, final couple of points for me, like I said, it, it, it's not something that's, that's a quick fix and um, it's something I know everyone naturally works upon a lesson. For us, when we talked about the person <coughs> launched how we're going to cope with literacy, Evan said, yeah we're doing it, we're doing it. And, and of course you're doing it. We're teachers, so we are teaching <coughs> literacy. I think to be more astute, to be more forensic, it'd be more pertinent now to look at the literacy barriers that exist in the students um, in their terminal, ones that exist that you know <coughs> has had an impact previously or is going to have a major impact on student performance and deal with it from day one. Our increases out and get buy-in and make sure everyone's seeing it from the same hymn sheet and you, you are relentless in it because there will be times when the students will come with a little resistance with this going, hang on a minute. You know, I, I couldn't evaluate um, effectively last year. What makes you think I'm going to be able to do this year? Stick with the, the process of the problem. 
Any questions? Yay! <laughs> we spoke on. Is there anything you want to send you after seeing our life? Or, or, or I can hear probably you guys kind of mm -hmm. and send down everything, everything that one. <coughs> They've been very patient. Thanks a minute for this little five o'clock in the evening. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.